we want to thank God so, so much this, um, this morning. Bless God for our bishop in the house, our mom in absentia. We really thank God for them. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And we thank God, Jehovah, for being so, so good to us. That which we have prayed about this morning is done. Hallelujah. It is done. Now, a story is told of a concert that was on Asifiwe. Tunajua concert ni nini? Sinio? Yes, there was a concert somewhere in a certain town. And so in this concert, people came and they were given one specific song to sing. And the song was Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So everyone, it was sort of like a competition of sorts, also a concert but a competition. And so everyone who was coming was coming to showcase how they can sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. And so people came and they sang in style and they sang in skill. And it was amazing. The band was there and they did a terrific job in their playing of the instruments. And then suddenly up came an old man who walked gracefully to the stage. Because you know when it's performance, the stage. Come and worship the altar. Still. So he walked to the stage majestically. And he got hold of the microphone. And he sang, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now, he did not know how to put the wavy vocals, you know? How commend is a vocal training? In the, before he came, when the others were coming and they were showcasing their skills, people would rise up after they would have finished the amazing grace and they would give a round of applause and a standing ovation. So people would stand up and give a standing ovation and a clap, a round of applause. But this man, after he came and sang, he did not have all those skills at all. But after he finished, by the time he was headed to finishing, people were on the floor. People were crying. People were wailing, you know? And by the time he finished the song and was walking off the stage, nobody could rise up to give a shout. Nobody could rise up to give a standing ovation. Nobody could rise up to give a round of applause. But everybody was somewhere playing prostrate, somewhere kneeling, kneeling next to their whatever, and they were literally crying to the Lord. Today, we want to look at the topic, worship. A spiritual discipline. <laughs> what does it feel? Worship, a spiritual discipline. And as we look at worship, that story that I've given to you, I want you to just keep reflecting on it even as we talk today and get to know, just keep thinking what could have been happening. Why were people on the floor? Why didn't they give him a standing ovation? Why didn't they clap? Why? Were they crying? What was the difference? What was the difference? John chapter 4 verses 23 to 24. John chapter 4 verses 23 to 24. We will read that one. What does the Bible say? Let's read it together. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. 24. Verses 24. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Let's go back to verse 23. The Bible says what? That the time is... And indeed, the time is, it is now. So we are not waiting for a future time. The time has already come. And then the Bible says what? When true worshipers, when you hear the word true, there must be a fault somewhere. See, no. Yes, so the Bible says when true worshipers will worship the Father 
in truth and in spirit. In other words, you can have very many worshippers, but in their midst, God is looking for someone who is worshipping him in truth and in spirit. This morning, we were worshipping. The, uh, the worship team led us uh, so well in song here. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying in song. They led us in song very powerfully and very well. But you know, even this morning, as we were sitting here, the father's eye was moving back and forth, seeking to see one or two people who are worshiping him in truth and in spirit. Why? Because then it means chances are that when we are in a congregation like this one, there are those who are worshipping in truth and in spirit, but there are also others who are not worshipping in truth and spirit. One as if you were, hit your neighbor and tell them, are you worshipping in truth and spirit? Praise the name of the Lord. Now, if there is something that has ever bothered me, it is when I'm supposed to be, uh, when I've been given an opportunity or a chance to buy a gift for someone whom I perceive to be so high there, someone whom I perceive to have everything. I don't know whether you always have that problem. You almost want to go asking people, what do you think so and so would require? Because you are not so sure that the thing you want to give them as a gift, you are not so sure whether they will appreciate it. You are not so sure whether they are in need of it. And so you keep moving back and forth, back and forth, and wondering what exactly, what form of a gift can I be able to give? In other words, you find yourself in a dilemma. And many times when we are in a meeting and we desire to give God the best gift, you might think that if I give him a million Kenya shillings, and it is good, by the way, if you have that million Kenya shillings, you can give him in the offering boxes, bonus, if you will. If you have that 100,000, you can still do it, give it. But you keep wondering, is this what will please his heart? Hallelujah. Is this what will please his heart? Now, God knows all things and possesses all treasures in heaven and on earth. In other words, even when we give in that big measure, still he is the one who gave it to us. He owns literally everything. He doesn't, he's in need of nothing. And I remember I, if you were here during the time when we were discussing about giving, you know what I'm talking about. God owns everything. The Bible says that silver and gold belongs to him, actually, all that you have and all that I have and I am belongs literally to him. But there is one commodity that the Lord always seeks to have. He longs to have it because he doesn't have it. He cannot do it himself. And that is the commodity that we call worship. God has a few he looks for someone who can just come around him and worship him in truth and in spirit. He looks for that one person. And there's a story that is told of a, a pastor who was organizing for a big call, uh, music extravaganza. And, and he had a very beautiful music team or worship team or choir, whatever name you're going to call it. it. He had a very nice one in his church. And in the process of planning and everything, that morning when the music extravaganza was supposed to, have it, to, be, have, uh, to be done, he passed on. And then he came back to life because I think he came back to life because who would have told the story? Born as if he were. So, <laughs> so I'm thinking he must have come back to life. That's a story that is told. And then when he was up, wherever he was, the Lord Jesus started taking him on a tour. And he told the Lord Jesus, you know what? My choir, the best choir in town, was having a music extravaganza. Would you allow me to at least listen to it? And the Lord said, it is okay, we will listen to it with you. But as they were seated and the, on earth, yeah, on earth, the worship was going on and people had been full in that place. Amazingly, this man of God together with Jesus could only hear one voice out of the team of about a thousand people. There was only one voice. And the pastor turned to, the, to, to, to Jesus and asked him, how come I can only hear one voice, yet my choir, I have trained them. It's a big choir. How come I can only hear one voice? 
And the Lord Jesus told him, it's only one person out of the thousand you have trained who is worshiping me in truth and in spirit. Could you have been that voice this morning? Wanna see you? Just a question. Now, what is worship? An attempt being very fast. What is worship? Worship has always been considered as one of the items in the church program. And in most cases, people don't really attach much importance to it. To run a program to uko home unangojia, especially if you're staying around Zimmerman. So and so is singing. When you're still in the house. And then you say, ah, service yenye waidanza, wacha nivavaye kidogo. Why? Because it's just music. So you say, now it's about seven o'clock. It's five minutes to seven. Let me run so that I can be able to get the word. What does it feel? Missing out on worship. Why? Because we do not attach importance to it. Worship is, however, the art of giving reverence to a supreme being. And in our case here, giving reverence to God. It is giving God the first place in our lives. It is giving God the first place in our lives. And today I want to bring it to us this morning that worship is not good music. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, worship is music. Worship is not good music. Worship is beyond. Music enhances. Music helps us to worship, but it is not worship in itself. Worship is the art of giving reverence to God. And that is how come even those people who are not able to talk or to hear can still worship God. Yet, they do not have the hearing ability because worship is something that goes beyond music. And people around the world worship very many things. Very many things. Even in Kenya, people worship very many things. There are those who worship relationships. There are those who worship their jobs. There are those who worship their businesses. What do we mean by this? Anything that you put ahead of God, that is the thing that you worship. And again, I want to bring it to us because we say today we are looking at worship as spiritual discipline. That which you worship, that which you esteem to be very high, you become like. Hallelujah. You become like that. I'd like us to read the book of Exodus chapter 20 verses 3. Exodus 20 verses 3. This is what the Bible says. You must not have any other God but me. And so if you find yourself esteeming these other things that I'm talking about, yeah? If you find yourself saying, I cannot come to the banquet, I have married a new wife. If you find yourself saying, I cannot come to the presence of the Lord, I opened a new business, then you have already created for yourself a God. Again, turn to anyone and ask them, what do you worship? Turn to the other one and tell them, what do you worship? Mm -hmm. Now, if all those things that I'm talking about and many others are the things that you have put ahead of time, then it's also worth noting that you have just started idolatry, though you do not have a carved image in your house. Hallelujah. Si tunasemaga carved image ndio eh? Carved image. <laughs> Yesterday my husband had an opportunity of going somewhere but he's on leave today. So he had an opportunity of going somewhere. Um, they were being taught on how to reach the Asian community for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so at some point he found himself going to the Asian temple. They were taken to the Asian temple, Pale Parklands. 
And so they entered there with some friends from Sitam. <laughs> and as they entered there, he came back and he told me, you know what? I discovered that Indians have 330 million gods. 330 million gods. And they don't have a problem allowing the Christians walking into their temples. Because if you can bring Jesus into the temple, then they will have 331 million <laughs> gods. And there are times when we behave like that. We have a God that is called money. We have a God that is called relationships. And Jesus is a part of those other gods. So when you are in need of a relationship, you are here. When you are in need of this other one, you are here. And you don't mind about having Jesus. But you know what? The Bible says, you shall have no other God but me. Hallelujah. Amen. What does it feel now, there are two elements of worship. There are two elements of worship, and we can find this in the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verses 3. Psalms 40, verses 3. It says, He has given me, this was David, He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what He has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in God. But he begins by saying that God has done what? Given me a new song to sing. When the Lord has done something, he puts a song in your heart. Even if your voice cannot be found on the keyboard, he will still put a song in your heart. And from that scripture, we can get the two elements of worship there. Number one is a celebration. When we come to worship, we celebrate. And when we're talking about a celebration, it is more of a vertical relationship. It is more of the thanksgiving you're giving to God. It is more of you saying, Lord, I'm here, I am worshiping you. I'm appreciating you because of who you are. I'm appreciating you because of what you have done. In other words, even me being able to wake up this morning and walk from my house to this place, it has taken Jehovah. What does it feel me being able to stand in this place, it's not because I am so important. It has taken his grace alone for me to be able to stand here. For me to be able to even put on clothes, it is because of him. So I come into the church with a heart full of thanksgiving. I'm walking through the doors with heart of praise because I am longing to praise him. And when I'm walking through the doors in this dimension of praise, I do not care whether the worship team is there or not, I can begin my dance from there. I can begin lifting my hands from the door because it is me the Lord has blessed. It is not just the worship team. You know, many times we go home and we say, Akila worship ilikuwa dry. Uliona vile hiyo worship team ilifanya. Ah, ah. The question is, did you have a praise in your heart? This team only comes to help us out they have picked a, a line of songs that will help us be able to vocalize that which the Lord has done. But if today you walked into this sanctuary and they had not reached, or you walked into this sanctuary on a Monday morning because the Lord has done it for you, it could be empty, the pews are empty, but you're walking with a bounce on your feet because he has done it for me. Paul is a it does not need your neighbor. It only needs you and God, an audience of one. And you can lift your voice. You can break forth in a dance, not just in the house of God. It could be in your bedroom. And you break forth and raise a sound of praise, raise a sound of celebration, because, Lord, you have done it for me. You have done it for me. Hallelujah. That is the dimension of praise. And it's like you're saying, from that scripture, it's like you're saying, how can I be silent? I cannot be silent, yet he has done it for me. Hallelujah. This is a song that the, 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 the Juniors for Christ sang, I think it was last conference, grand opening, and they went like, um, 
My God is alive. How can I keep it inside? I won't be silent. My God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Now, when God has done it for you, Aungo J, Pastor Millicent, Akudia, Ibe, Leo, Iseme. Hallelujah. That is a discipline. You can praise, you can bust in thanksgiving, even in your very own house. The second dimension is where we are saying the proclamation. Proclamation. He has done it. You are celebrating. But now it's proclamation. Proclamation. In as much as celebration is more of you and him, you are thanking him. You are appreciating him for what he has done. You are not keeping silent. But now when you come to proclamation, I will come here to my sister Rosemary and I tell her, you know what the Lord did for me. What has he feel? I am proclaiming what the Lord has done. I am standing and I'm not keeping quiet. I am praising him, but I'm also talking to my brother and sister here. And I'm telling them the Lord has done it for me. Hallelujah. It's like you're telling them, Amen. Unajua jana si kuwa na pesa ya kununua food. Amen. Itendea. You know my so-and-so was unwell. Amen. Itendea. You do a proclamation. Hallelujah. Now, as we read John chapter 4, John chapter 4, uh, verses 19 to 20. Verses 19 to 20. This is what the Bible says. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. This is the story of the Samaritan woman who has come to fetch water at lunch hour when it's hot because she does not want to meet with very many people. And then she meets Jesus waiting for her there. And... Verse, verses 19 again, it says, Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Verses 20. So tell me, why is it that, the, that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Many times, many times we have hindrances, things that cause us not to worship effectively. Just like this woman, there were things that were causing them not to worship effectively. And she develops a conversation with Jesus Christ and she's asking Jesus, how come the Jews are saying that people worship in Jerusalem and us Samaritans, we are saying that people worship on the mountain. It's like different worldviews, different cultures. How come you people are worshiping in this way and us, we are worshiping this way so we cannot come together. Many times for us to worship effectively, we must be willing to reject any strong Strongholds that are standing in the way of our worship. Where I come from, we could be worshiping in one way. Where you come from, you worship in another way. But are we worshiping the same God? If yes, you are my brother and my sister. Hallelujah. Now, this woman was struggling. She struggles with the penetrating issues that have been raised by Jesus, the barriers that were put because of their various cultural issues. And many Christians have settled for cheap limitations of true worship. Some relate worship to a particular event or building. What if I do not enter into this sanctuary, then I cannot worship. Now, let me tell you, worship should be a lifestyle. You can worship from Monday to Monday, when you come into the church, you just join up with the rest of the people because of the celebration, the proclamation part. But worship is not limited to the church or to this building that we have here. Hallelujah. You can worship in your house. You can worship in your workplace. And by the way, worship, when you're in your workplace, at your boss is wondering what is happening. You know, there still needs to be decency and order. So depending on where you are, you can still be in worship because even the things that you are doing is a worship to the King of Kings. Hallelujah. 
The way you're balancing those books, when you're doing them and you're not doctoring the figures if you're an accountant, that is a worship to the king of kings. The way you're teaching those children, if you know that these children have been given to me, I have to mold them in the ways of the Lord and you're doing it the right way, that is a worship to the Lord. The way you are injecting that patient when they come into your hospital and you're not mistreating them, that is a worship to the Lord. So worship should actually be 24-7. It is not a discipline that waits for a, a confinement. It's not an event like we normally say we have a worship experience, which is an event. Worship goes beyond the worship experience. It is your day-to-day -day activity. As, as a woman, as a wife, you're married and you're making meals for your children. That is a worship to the Lord. What has the feel? So, many times, like we are saying, people relegate worship to a particular event. And many times, worship is considered to be the music in a corporate service that is followed by the preaching. An entire style of music has been labeled praise and worship. And many times, as worship teams, me included, we fall into the trap of imagining that we are more important when we are singing contemporary worship and we feel we are way up there, we are better than that woman who has raised the sound of Kegosho in the village. Let me tell us one thing. Those who are in the worship team, let me tell you one thing. That even that woman who has raised a kigosho, if it has been raised from the depth of the heart, God could be hearing her more than he's hearing us. Hallelujah. Because it is something that springs forth from the heart, depth of the heart. Number two, worship recognizes the Savior. John chapter 4 verse 26. Worship recognizes the Savior. As we wait for it to be projected, 4 verse 26. After Jesus exposed the false assumptions of worship, he guides the Samaritan woman into an amazing recognition of his glory and his mission to save the lost. And he says, then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Hallelujah. Worship is you coming to the reality that Jesus is the Messiah. Hallelujah. Worship is coming to a point where he is not just a carpenter. Hallelujah. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord of Lords. That is what worship is all about. True worship erupts in the soul of one who understands that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away sin. He is the living water that cleanses and quenches the deepest heart thirst of one's soul, using water as a metaphor for eternal life. You are able to worship him effectively when you recognize him as the Messiah. Many times, that takes me back to the hymns. This is my story. Praising my Savior. How does it start? Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. If you sing that song with understanding, it gets deeper into our hearts. On a Recognizing him as the Messiah. And worship is centered around scripture. Around scripture. That is the third point. Worship is centered around scripture. I'll say this, then I'll sit down. Worship is centered around scripture. You must know what the Bible says about him who died and rose again. You must know what the scripture says about him. Because it's only when I know what the Bible says about him that I'll be able to say, I'll be able to say that he is my Lord. Hallelujah. 
I'll be able to say at the cross, at the cross. What does it feel? At the cross, at the cross. All my attention, because worship is about him. It's not about me. It's about him. It's more vertical. It cannot come back to me. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. That is what worship is all about. When you, it is centered around scripture. When it is centered around scripture, you will not rise up as a Christian and begin singing Ananipenda, Leo, Kuliko, Jana. Which scripture says that? His love remains the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and what else does he feel? When you know that he has raised you and seated you with Christ in heavenly places, you will not go singing anguka nayo. Una anguka ukienda wapi? What else does he feel? There are certain things that we find ourselves singing because it's a popular opinion. It is a popular opinion. One time, we went to Mombasa, and I'll be out of here, and entered a certain church. And then they were singing a worship song, and they were lifting their hands. And this is what they were singing. Shetani nai. Wamefunga macho. Wanasifiwe. Na wameinua nili? Shetani nai. Anainama. Anainuka. Anaona moto. Anatoroka. Who is being worshipped in that song? What is wasifiwe? What am I saying? Those lyrics, before you can raise them and you're saying you're raising them to the Father, look at each line critically. Do not just sing because it's popular in the TV, it's popular in the streets. Look at them critically. Are they talking about your Savior? Who are they talking about? Are they glorifying the enemy more than your Savior? Actually, when you're worshipping, you need not to give any mileage or any airtime to the enemy. Hallelujah. But God has given me victory. Hallelujah. You need to look at the scriptures and let your worship be in line with scripture. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you praise and I give you honor. You are a good God. We thank you, Lord, for this lesson that we have learned. Yes, not exhaustively, but I know your spirit will continue teaching us, my Father, even on the same in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us, my God, to be able to destroy every stronghold that hinders us, oh God, to worship you. Help us to recognize you, my Father, as the Messiah, that Jehovah God, as we worship you, will be able to worship you in truth and in spirit. We give you thanks and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.